Okay. So we are going to talk today a bit deep dive into sodium butyrate and because it's so important and it ties in to the GLP-1 conversation I've been having on my podcast lately and people are really getting into it. And I did a short podcast recently talking about how berberine was not nature's ozempic and sodium butyrate is not either, but what they are and what I think sodium butyrate has actually a multitude beyond, berberine has some really nice impacts, but I think sodium butyrate might be the most efficacious of these. Their GLP-1 inducers or signalers, they potentiate the cells in our body naturally occurring to make our own endogenous GLP-1. Uh, can you talk about what sodium butyrate is, where it's made in the body, why it's so important? Let's start there. Sodium butyrate is really cool. It's technically, you know, this new term that they're still really defining of a postbiotic. It's a short chain fatty acid that's biosynthesized in the colon. And it's essentially a molecule that is produced by specific bacteria when they eat specific fibers. So resistant starches are the most popular. I was talking recently about a study that was done out of the University of Leeds in England recently. And I think it was last year. And it was a 20 year study on over a thousand people and they gave them a green banana a day. And they looked at the data and there was a 60% reduction in total body cancers. Well, why a green banana? It's a resistant starch. And what does that do in the gut? It produces butyrate. So we do not eat green bananas. We don't eat plantains. We don't even eat enough fiber. I mean, the typical American diet has like no fiber in it anymore. And so we're seeing this like systemic low levels of butyrate. I mean, I, I rarely hear that people do a gut test and say like, oh, I have ample levels of short chain fatty acid production. It's just uncommon. And I think combined with the use you know, rampant use of antibiotics combined with herbicides and pesticides that affect our gut microbiome. We are lacking in the bacteria that produce butyrate. We're lacking in the foods that those bacteria need. And butyrate is such a critically important molecule in the gut for so many reasons. It's the main food source of the colonocytes in the gut. They have a really fast turnover. So they need that food. It's extremely anti-inflammatory in the gut. It's responsible for telling immune cells what type of immune functions to act out. Um, on you know other levels from the gut, it has systemic benefits from its role as an HGAC inhibitor, histone deacetylase. It basically determines the role, like the way our DNA is coiled and how that is transcribed. Its role as a chemical chaperone, breaking down toxins. Um, that attach to your nuclear and mitochondrial DNA. It's fascinating. I mean, there's so much, there's so much going on with butyrate, whether it's, there was a great study that came out of Columbia University and the NIH is working on its role in chronic fatigue syndrome. There are some incredible studies that came out this year looking at pediatric obesity. And, you know, this is a population that probably cannot take semaglutide and may not be appropriate for them right. for you know, a multitude of reasons, but there's natural ways that they can go about inducing and influencing the secretion of GLP-1. Yes. Yes, exactly. My whole jam is that we start with natural stuff first. We add in what we need. We build, we pull out the big guns as needed, right? But really focusing predominantly, and I think this is where people get severely off track. And I've said this before on the podcast, the folks using GLP-1 agonist, the drug version, which is the peptides alone and not doubling down on an insulin sensitive lifestyle, not doubling down on healing their gut, getting their monk trees ready to lose fat, getting their monk trees ready to detoxify. If you don't have all the right cofactors and you don't have all the right molecules in place, I think that's why we're seeing trouble with the use of these drugs. And you're absolutely right. I don't think it's a first line for anyone. I don't think they're a first line, especially for children. I do think that if they are being used though, that people could do a whole lot better with their lifestyle and their overall health right. and use them as tools to get that lifestyle piece dialed, mm -hmm. right? And then using these supplements and whatever adjunctive treatments we, we need as sort of icing on the cake, because that's, I think, again, that's why people are withdrawing from these drugs, getting off of them and gaining all the weight back. I'm like, well, you never, you know, you Adjusted never- your lifestyle. Yeah. You never dealt with your insulin resistance. <laughs> you just turned it down with a drug 
And then it turned back on the minute you go off of it. And I just think there's a better way. I think getting these this endogenous production as dialed in as we can. And endogenous for the listeners means your body's making it. Our body mm -hmm. makes GLP-1, like you were saying, and we need certain nutrients to do that. And that's where I had a professor tell me once in naturopathic school, he said, death starts in the colon, like straight mm -hmm. up. And so day one of graduating and opening my practice, I ran gut tests on every single patient, whether they presented with gut issues or not. I didn't care. I was like, I want to see what your gut's doing, because if death starts in the colon, we got to figure out what your, what your gut's doing. And yeah. you're right. Nobody had enough short chain fatty acids. It's, yeah. we are dealing with a epidemic of low production <laughs> and whether it's because they're not ingesting or things aren't working right there, or the cells aren't signaling correctly, but it's a big one. Um, yeah. And then I mean, the it's, it's oh, a fact for us that, that was not, I mean, it wasn't an ancillary product, but it was an important product. It was kind of during COVID times that it, it like switched, like people started just paying attention to their gut health so much more. And in the last five years, it's grown 500% for us. I mean, it's just incredible. It's It was something that I think was very difficult to understand to a general audience, but there's so many more of us taking our health into our own hands, taking our health so much more seriously, being our own advocates, our own educators. And it's grown exponentially, not only for our practitioner business, but our direct-to-consumer business, because a lot of people have been failed by, I think, the probiotic industry and how many claims that they've made and it's not necessarily helping. It's true. And there are some folks like myself who can't handle high doses of probiotics. I They tear me apart and it's they say, oh, you just got to get past that. And there was never any getting past it in some cases. And many of my patients who had inflammatory bowel disease or really severe IBS, probiotics were just like fire. You know, it was just like lighter fluid on the fire, I should say. And what I would tell them back then, you know, butyrate, the butyrate I had been exposed to up until your product line was pretty stinky stuff. And yours is not so stinky. It's still stinky, but <laughs> yeah, it's not but, as stinky. No, it's not as stinky. Although I will say I have other forms in the works. So there's a form that I'm working on that's going to have no stink whatsoever. And it's encapsulated in lipid beadlets. So children will be able to take it, which is so oh, wonderful. Wonderful.